Hello everyone and welcome to another MoTeC webinar. My name is Mark McCoy. I'll be your presenter for today. Today's topic is what is CAM control? And this is more of an introduction into uh, what we mean when we say CAM control when it comes to you know what the ECU needs to actually control what it needs uh, as inputs and outputs etc. So this is more or less a introduction to what it is with a couple of bits of, um, of help along the way. Uh, what I will be doing in the future is doing a, a, this will be like a two or three part series I suppose where the next ones will involve um, the actual setup if you had um, nothing to go by to start with. What we'll assume today is that uh, most of you will be running a start file of some description from a car that's already been done so the cam control will already be set up um, all you really need to do is a uh, part of your normal checks of once you're starting to tune this engine what to have a quick look at our topics will be well, quite simply to start with what is cam control I'll mention some variations, some of them we support, some of them uh, we haven't sort of really messed around with yet. Uh, what ECUs do I need and also what upgrades does that ECU need? What are the inputs and outputs? So what goes into the ECU to calculate what it needs to do on the outputs? Uh, some basic checks and at the end I've got some fairly important information, um, mainly a couple of uh, don'ts more than anything. To start with, when we're talking about cam control, we're talking about changing the, the phasing or the timing of that actual cam. Now anyone who's sort of worked in the, in the tuning industry for a while will know, like you get your good old um, Chev 350 and they'll have like a maybe the front pulley for the cam will have a couple of different keyways in it so you can advance or retard the cam to change the engine's power characteristics. Now obviously in this system, um, you know, there's not much you can do about having this change on the fly. So while the guy's going around the track, he's got what he's got. In the early systems back in sort of the, the let's say, uh, late 80s, early 90s, uh, they started to get a, a couple of cars with engines that had um, what they then called cam control, but effectively what it was was a, a simple switched system. So the cam would simply switch between two different positions. There was a fully advanced and a fully retarded. So it was either on or off, forwards or back, advanced or retarded, however you want to say it. But uh, it had two positions and that was it. So you know, effectively you got um, a pretty good gain by being able to spread the torque. But in between those two positions you couldn't get anywhere there. So things like the, the earlier Honda VTEC, the B16 and B18 engines, they actually switched between two different cam profiles. So they weren't actually moving the cam, they were actually allowing the engine to use effectively a different cam profile. So it switched between the two. Uh, the 20 valve Toyota 4AGs, some of the uh, SR20s and the early uh, Myvec 1.6 litre Mitsubishi engines, if anyone remembers the Cyborg R Mirages. They simply had a simple system that had an on-off switch and that it would flick the cam from fully retarded to fully advanced in one foul swoop or vice versa. Nowadays pretty much everything is coming out with what we would call a continuously variable camshaft or a fully variable camshaft. So basically the difference between this is that you still have your two end stops, your fully advanced and your fully retarded stops mechanically, but then the ECU will actually control the cam to any position between those two points. So there's no steps anymore, it's like a continuous movement. So basically you can map the engine and have the cam exactly where you want it for maximum performance at, at any given load and RPM uh, that the uh, driver is likely to use. So some of these examples of engines would be the, the new iVTEC Honda engines, the K20A, uh, the Toyota, the 2ZZGE, any of the engines they do with the VVTI symbol on them. 
the Nissan VQ35s and 37s from your uh, 350 and 370Z engines, and the new, well, not quite so new anymore, the, the Evo 9 engine and the Evo 10 engines also, they'll be called Mivec engines, but they're actually a continuously variable camshaft instead of a switched camshaft now. So this fully variable camshaft control is basically what we're going to be talking about in this series of webinars. The uh, um, switch cam is quite simple, it's just you need a, a load and RPM tape which tells it when to be on and when to be off and that's it. This one uh, is a little bit different. What the ECU is actually controlling is, a, um, and I've got a bit of a diagram here, you probably want to re-watch this webinar after it's been recorded, I'm not going to stick around too long. Um, you might want to pause it on a, on a later recording, but basically the, the large grey sort of uh, piece in the middle of that uh, my diagram of a valve block is effectively like a shuttle valve which directs oil backwards and forwards uh, to retard ports and advanced ports. So advanced ports basically push the cam forward, the retard port does the opposite, pushes in uh, retard. The ECU is controlling the solenoid at the end via a closed loop PID control and what that grey valve does is it, it will float over each of the, uh, the different ports to allow the oil to go in either direction. Now just one thing for uh, people so that they can be quite clear, when the valve is off it will go to one position, generally it will go to the you know, retard position so if you unplug that solenoid, the cam will go to its most retarded um, place. Some of the cams actually have a spring position, so that's not true for every single engine, but what I'm trying to say is that to make that cam hold one position, say 10 degrees advance, the valve still needs to be controlled to a uh, more or less a cam lock position, and then from there the ECU will either lower the duty cycle to run the cam in retard or, or raise the duty cycle to move the, uh, the shuttle valve to allow the cam to advance. So when the valve is off, it's not controlling, but it won't lock the cam in a position. Okay, So it needs a certain amount of duty cycle to hold the cam locked in one position. So that will become more clear uh, in the, the future um, cam control webinars. But just for now, this is just to give you an idea of what the, uh, the um, ECU is controlling. So once the oil comes out of that control valve, it goes into like the, the actual cam actuator. Now again, this is another diagram that you probably want to um, have a bit better look at um, in the future by looking at the recording and pausing it. But basically, if we look at the grey part, imagine that's connected to the cam and the outer part that I haven't coloured in is the pulley. So effectively, when we allow oil in and out of those advance and retard ports, it pushes the cam backwards and forwards relative to the pulley. So the pulley will always stay in the same position relative to the crank, so it's not moving. But we push the cam around inside that pulley. So the, the crank is still driving this camshaft, it's just that the phasing is allowed to move <coughs> excuse me, within some mechanical stops inside the actual pulley itself. And what uh, the tuner will ultimately be messing around with will be a three-dimensional map for the cam. So as a bit of an example here we can see a, an engine possibly a turbo engine based on uh, manifold pressure and RPM where at that point that's highlighted in blue they've asked for 35 degrees of advance on that cam. So the ECU will control that cam to get to 35 degrees advance. Now one thing I should probably make fairly clear, those numbers, the 35 degrees of advance, that's from the, the uh, retarded mechanical stop. Um, again, in future webinars I'll be sort of explaining there's a couple of different ways of doing it, but basically we would say zero cam advance would be 
up against the fully retarded mechanical stop. Now that's not an indication of the classic cam timing, like you know where is the the lobe center relative to you know top dead center or bottom dead center or anything like that. This simply says we are moving that cam from wherever it is on the fully retarded mechanical stop to 35 degrees of crank rotation more advanced than that. So if someone's asking what's the cam timing, you know they're usually talking about you know what are lobe centers and things like that. This has got nothing to do with that. This is simply where is the mechanical stop? We want to go 35 degrees of advance from that point. So I know a lot of people would prefer to see that uh, as a, an actual, maybe a lobe center or whatever, but uh, it's not quite how it works. Some of the variations you will get, um, the early BMW M3 six cylinders and M5 V8s, they had a slightly different system. Rather than having that shuttle valve, they more or less had two injectors per can. One was an advance injector and one was a retard injector. So on those engines, you had to have two outputs per can. So effectively, it doubled the, uh, the number of outputs you needed uh, to run the engine. So for something like the M5 V8, which had variable inlet and exhaust cams, uh, you effectively had to have eight outputs just to run the cam. So it got, uh, it got um, pretty hungry on output resources. Uh, some of the modern engines will have like an electromagnetic clutch style system. They seem to work all right. The uh, VQ35HR engines, I believe, had those on the exhaust cam. Uh, seem to work kind of similar to the, the oil system that I've described before with one single output. Um, another one that we've seen quite recently is the, the latest generation of um, Toyota V8s. They actually have a, a servo motor which will make the cam spin faster than the engine or slower than the engine to advance or retard it. Now we haven't done much work on, on these ones. In theory we could run them but uh, to be honest we haven't uh, really tested it yet. As for ECUs, uh, if we're talking continuously variable camshaft engines, the 100 series or the 400, the M600 and the M800, they will do continuously variable cams. The M84, which is our uh, newest addition, um, that will not run the continuously variable cams, but it will do the switched cams. Uh, as with uh, basically all of our ECUs, even the earlier M4s and M48s, they will run a switched cam because it's a very simple control, but you need a 100 series ECU to do the continuously variable camshafts. Um, the continuously variable camshaft control is an upgrade, so you'll have to talk to your dealers about uh, making sure your ECU has this feature enabled. Um, for single dual or quad cam control, still only one upgrade. So whether you're doing your, uh, your um, VVTi Toyota with a, a single variable inlet cam or your BMW M5 V8 with four variable cams, you just need the one upgrade. There's no specific ones for the number of cams. You just need that one upgrade. Um, running a switched cam, by the way, um, that's very simple. That needs no upgrade. And just one feature that's, that's um, quite good is the cam control upgrade is not needed to measure the position of the cam. Okay? So if you think about in the control, we've asked the ECU to drive the cam to a certain position. So there's because it's a closed loop PID thing, there will be some feedback. That's the cam position measurement. That's a standard feature on all of the ECUs. Um, we've used that before just to simply, you know, data log the position of a cam on an engine where, you know, maybe it's been piggybacked or something like that, and we just kind of want to know where the cam is. So you can do cam position measurements, no worries, but it's the actual control of that cam that needs the upgrade. So what do we actually need to uh, run this besides the 100 series ECU and the uh, cam control upgrade? Well, 
we basically need two things. We need to be able to let the ECU measure where the position of the cam is. So is it advanced, is it retarded, is it 10 degrees or, or whatever. Now, what will usually happen is you have your ref sync input, so your crank and your cam sensors. On the current engines, it's, it's quite normal to have the sync move um, with the camshaft. So we need to write um, we need to write software to um, you know recognize that this sync sensor is going to move around. So some of the crazy patterns you'll see on the crank and cam sensor these days are designed so that one, the engine can sync um, and two, that the ECU can work out where the camshaft is no matter where it goes without disturbing that synchronization. Some of the early engines like the first variable cam Subaru uh, EJ20 engines, they had a separate sync which didn't move and then on the other end of the cam they had a separate uh, cam position sensor which did actually move. But uh, more often than not these days the sync will more or less do two jobs. It will work out where the engine is in its cycle for synchronization purposes, running your injectors and your ignition, and also it will calculate where the cam shaft is in its uh, advance or retard map. Now, one other very important thing I will mention is that the cam and crank trigger patterns are designed uh, by Subaru, Mitsubishi, whoever, to be a matched set and also their positions are a matched set, so to speak. We write software to match what the factory does. So you have to be careful when you start wanting to... It, generally, we've seen people who think, OK, well, you know, I've got 45 degrees of advance on this cam, but I actually want it to be in a different range, so they'll maybe move it one tooth on the, uh, on the camshaft pulley. That can actually affect the way the ref and sync patterns match each other and it can potentially stop the engine working. So the software is written for the factory setups. Okay? If you need to modify anything, it's probably best to call us or discuss with us what you want to do and we can give you some ideas of how far you can move things, um, where the teeth patterns need to line up, etc. Um, my general recommendation would be probably just leave it alone and not mess with it. For outputs, um, generally speaking, um, apart from the BMWs, you'll have one pulse width modulated signal out of the ECU and that can run direct to the solenoid that is controlling the cam. Um, I've seen one of the more modern BMW V10s, the, uh, the solenoid's resistance was quite low so it used quite a lot of current so it's probably pushing the limits um, of uh, current for the ECU, but it still seemed to work okay because the uh, signal is pulse width modulated, so it's a frequency type signal. So the overall current draw of that solenoid is is quite low. So you know, we it, maybe it was pushing the bounds, but it seemed to work fine. Didn't cause any dramas, so that was all okay. Probably a good idea to, um, if you're not sure if this is a new type of engine that we haven't uh, had a look at, probably a good idea to send us the um, resistance measured across the solenoid pins. Now, for the earlier BMW stuff with the, the two outputs per cam, um, some of them used to need a, a diode removed, but um, we've written that into the software now. So if someone says you need to start machining things, uh, generally that's not the case. I don't think there's too many of these engines um, about anymore that people are doing this with. Don't hear about it very often. Um, the servo motor control for the new Toyotas, which I mentioned, um, it's, we've sort of theoretically come up with a way to run that, but it's a fairly complicated device, so it's probably going to need an ADL3 dash logger as part of the control loop as well. So, you know, anyone buying the new, I believe it's the one you are, V8, uh, just be a bit careful that it might not just be as simple as bugging an M800 on it to make the cams work but we'll know a bit more in the future. Just for some basic checks, 
of an engine. Now, as I said at the beginning, I'm going to assume that your engine is one that we have already characterized and it's been around for a while. Um, so it already runs, the cam control's already set up. Again, as I said, in future webinars, I'll be detailing the actual setup. But if we have a car that is already set up, um, generally what I would recommend is, is get the car started and put up a chart recorder for the cam position. So in this case, I've got a, a chart recorder in green there of the cam position for the right inlet. Now, what you want to do is, with the engine running, you can either unplug the cam solenoid. Now, just remember that I mentioned that because I've got my, uh, my warnings at the end. There's a bit more to that. So that will effectively allow the cam to go back to generally the most retarded position on the inlet. Uh, the exhaust is probably going to go to the most advanced. Um, some, if anyone's got the, the BABF Falcon turbo engines, I believe they've got a spring position in them, so that won't give the desired result. The other way you can get the cam to run to its um, most retarded position is simply in the cam map request a position that you know it can't get to. So on an inlet cam, for example, you can say um, go to negative 20. Now obviously the cam, or well, hopefully the cam should never be able to get to minus 20. And the idea is that we want to check the offset of the cam measurement. Now this is effectively similar to the CRIP setting in the uh, ECU. So the CRIP setting is to basically give the uh, ECU an idea of where is top dead center compression number one for purposes of ignition timing, injection timing, etc. The offset parameter here is basically to give the ECU an idea of what is zero when it comes to cam position. Now, I would normally set the most retarded position to be zero. So the idea is adjust the offset parameter until you get that zero. Now, I know some people uh, will set zero to be halfway through their um, cam range. So if the, the cam's got 30 degrees of um, movement, they'll have zero as halfway and be able to go to minus 15 and positive 15. Like I said, and I'll mention later in the later webinars, there is a bit of flexibility in the setup. You can really uh, mess around with and, and sort of set up the way you, uh, the way you want. One thing that I would sort of mention, um, and this is more a practicality of the, the PID setup, is that um, the cam position, what I would normally do is have it set so on the inlet cam that the fully retarded mechanical stop would be negative one. Now, the reason for this is that when we request zero in the cam map, which is quite common for the way people are tuning these things. If, let's say, the cam measurement, because it will bounce around a little bit with the engine running, maybe it's jumping between 0 and 0.5. If you're requesting 0 and 0 is hard up against the mechanical stop, what will happen is the uh, ECU will try to drive it hard against that mechanical stop to achieve 0. Okay. Now what happens then is the next time you request it to go forward, say to 10 degrees, there will be some lag. So what I would suggest is if you are planning on having um, zero as your um, most retarded position, say, I would set the offset so that um, you know when you unplug the cam or drive it hard up against the stop with your minus 20 request, have that as minus one. So every time you ask for zero, there's a one degree leeway where the cam will sort of hold just off that mechanical stop. You won't get the, uh, the ECU trying to drive it hard into that um, mechanical stop and you won't get the lag on the first um, initial request for you know, 5, 10, 15 degrees. So just a bit of a practicality on the exhaust cam, it might need to be positive one because the exhaust cams will generally, um, when you unplug them, will go to their most advanced and then so zero will be their most advanced and you will tune it to be minus 10, minus 20, minus 15, that kind of thing. So 
just to check, uh, just to make sure that uh, the cams are where they should be and the ECU knows where the cams should be. Okay, just another thing that you would uh, probably want to check is just make sure that with the engine running, the cam follows the request. So what we have here is my table. You might just run the engine at one fixed sort of load and RPM. Um, so just start with the highlighted sort of um, cell on the map. What you would do is just start typing in some other numbers. You're not really going to hurt anything. So if that, say, was zero and the cam was sitting at zero, you type in 10, the request, which is the aim in red on my little chart recorder, will jump up to 10 and the cam should follow it pretty much straight away. Um, obviously being a, a mechanical system there will be a slight amount of lag but we're talking uh, in the milliseconds, we're not talking one or two seconds. So you should be able to type in a number in that one cell and have the cam follow your request uh, quite quickly. Um, so you, you need to make sure of these things. Okay. Um, Probably one thing to, to mention which uh, seems to come up every now and then is some of the engines, um, they don't sort of really have enough oil pressure to control the cams accurately at idle. So you'll find some manufacturers won't try to start moving the cams until say 1,000, 1,200 RPM or something like that once the oil pressure has come up. So if you're doing this check, you probably need to just get up above idle. Uh, it's really going to depend on the engine, um, but you, you want to check it and make sure that there's uh, plenty of oil pressure. Um, oil temperature can also affect this, but again, um, I'll detail that a bit more in future um, webinars. So just for this one, you want to check your zero and you want to check that the cam actually follows your aim. Again, this is a map that you've probably got, which has been a startup file for an engine that we've already done. Now, some very important information. Generally speaking, or basically every single engine I've seen with variable cams from the factory is designed to be non-interference, which effectively means no matter where the cam is, whether it be fully advanced, halfway, or fully retarded, the valves will not touch the pistons. Okay. So they're designed that if something goes wrong, either the output shorts to ground or to 12 volts, no matter where the cam goes, you won't smash the valves into the pistons. Okay. Now, the, what, the reason I mention this is it's happened quite a few times where people will uh, run engines in a racing series and they will change the cams to a larger duration or larger lift type of cam. What you must do when you're building this engine is to make sure that no matter where that cam ends up, like fully advanced or fully retarded stops, that mechanically the valves will not interfere with the pistons. Now this is something you, the ECU is not in control of. You must set this mechanically. Now some of these engines, um, the uh, Alloy Tech V6s is a, a prime culprit because it's uh, used in a, a couple of different racing series. They put bigger cams in because it responds really well, but the smart guys measure everything up and they narrow the uh, range that the cam will work over mechanically. Okay? The guys who don't tend to do this tend to ring us up and wonder why the cam control didn't stop the engine smashing itself to pieces. It's a mechanical limitation. You need to make sure that the mechanical setup of your engine is still non-interference. And if that involves pulling apart the cam actuators and uh, changing their mechanical limits, well, then that's what you have to do. Um, any change in cam profile, um, especially if it, you go to a, a larger cam, um, larger valve springs, etc., could mean that you need to retune the PIMD. So again, not something I'm covering here today, uh, but we'll cover in the future. So effectively, a PID control loop is the ECU's response to a mechanical system. If you change the mechanical system, then you need to change the PID. Okay.
Well, I hope that's been uh, informative and answered the, the first lot of questions people might have had about uh, what CAM control is. Um, again, as I said, there will be, uh, I think in a, another few weeks, there will be the, the part two to this where I'm going to start going through um, and talking about things like uh, how to set it up. If you had an engine that you, uh, that well, we hadn't characterized before and you wanted to set it up yourself, there are some basic checks to go through um, to get the, uh, the setup of the cam control sorted. It's not difficult. Um, it is a little bit time consuming. Um, so there's a few things you have to know and a few tests you have to do first to make it all sort of work nicely. As with all of our webinars, uh, these are being recorded. Um, that uh, and they will be put up on our website. Um, well, probably later today. You can also look at the the list of uh, of um, ones we've done previously. Uh, also, the Motec forum. Just like any other forum, you should probably join that. So, if you're uh, working late at night and there's there's no one here in Australia, you can put a a question on the uh, forum and. Um, uh, someone around the world could